Right, we're on. Today we're going to talk about the left wrist and the golf swing, how that controls the club face, we all know that. But how do we control the left wrist? That's what controls the club face, but we need to be able to control the left wrist to control the club face, obviously. Now I'm right-handed, so I'm right-hand dominant, so everything I do is pretty much with my right hand. So I'm going to use my right hand to control my left wrist to control the club face. Doesn't that just make sense? So yeah, we're going to talk about how the right hand can control the left hand. Okay, so we know at the top of the backswing, that if your left hand gets cupped, then the club face is going to be open. Cupped. Club face open, leading edge straight up and down. If the, if the left hand gets bowed, try and get in there. Leading edge horizontal, rest your pint on there, glass of wine. Open. Closed. We understand that, don't we? What does that mean, though? Well, that means that club face being open up the top of my swing, and I've got this left hand in a cupped position, so therefore club face open. There's a chance, just a chance, that when I come back down, I'm going to leave the, the wrist in that position and not get to a nice flat wrist through impact. I'm going to be a little bit more cupped, therefore the face is going to be open through impact. That can cause the slice. My word, it can cause more than just a slice by the looks of it. And then of course if my, my left wrist is bowed and I'm too much in this position at the top, something has to happen on the way down to prevent the ball going left. It was sore as well. So this cupping and bowing of the left wrist makes club face open, close, 45 degrees at the top there is level, square, square. Now I'm right handed, so most of the stuff I do when I open the door, I open the door right handed, I switch on, use my phone, everything's all right handed. Um, so I'm going to use my right hand to control my left hand. Again, this goes back to a previous video that I did on about educating the hands. If we can educate the hands, it's going to educate the club face, therefore we're going to be in much better positions. Educating the hands is so important, such an important part of the golf swing. Homer Kelly's Golf Machine talks about that. Educated hands means an educated golf club, therefore educated strike. It's deep, isn't it? That is deep. So if I grip the golf club there and I take the club back till the club's parallel to the ground. Now that leading edge of that golf club is vertical. Okay. So my left wrist is just a little bit cupped for that to happen. Okay, I can cup it more. And now the club face is opening even more when the club's parallel to the ground. I can get in a bowed position there. So you can see the leading edge is now pointing more towards the ground. So you can see the left wrist as well is much more bowed. Now I want to be somewhere in between. Ideally I want that leading edge to be at my spine angle. More along this line, my spine angle. Therefore leading edge or back of left wrist is nice and flat. So as the club comes back to get to this position, I want to feel as though my right hand controls my left. So I'm actually turning my right hand just a little bit down to the ground, which is ensuring the cupping there is disappeared by that motion. So I've taken the right hand and just turned it a fraction to get the leading edge in line with my spine. Left hand's on there, like so. There we go. So now you can see back of left wrist nice and flat. There. Leading edge is the same as my spine. And my right hand, in order for that to happen, my right hand's done that action. Turned down the way towards the ground. Just a fraction. When we take the club back and we get to this club level to the ground position, measurable position 2 we'll call it, there's 1, there's 2, club shaft parallel to the ground. By seeing where the leading edge is, it's going to dictate what happens when the left arm gets parallel to the ground and then the top of the swing. So if we get this position wrong, MP2, measurable position 2 wrong, then 3 is going to be wrong, 4 is going to be wrong and something's going to have to give. A perfect example of that would be Dustin Johnson. Now Dustin Johnson's mega mega bowed at the top. So as he's in this position, his club face is his club face is super closed because of that. So he has to do something on the way down to take that out. So he's got a real fault in his swing. 
between his one millions, don't get me wrong. But this fault in his swing, he incorporates another fault to bring it out. So two faults, do two wrongs make a right? In Dustin's case, yeah, they do, absolutely. So what does Dustin do on the way down? He's here, comes down, has to aggressively turn the body and lift the handle up a little bit to make sure the club face is square. So he's really, really bowed. If he continued through, being bowed, his club face would be closed. So what does he do? He turns his body and lifts his hands up, which squares the face. Now that's a characteristic as opposed to a fault. Azinger's grip, too strong, changes his swing to help for the grip. Characteristic opposed to a fault. Bernard Langer, similar sort of idea. Jim Furyk, lots of faults, puts in something else. So it becomes a characteristic as opposed to a fault. But for us, it's hard to put another fault in to already fix the fault we have because we're not that educated in the golf swing like these guys are. So if we can get to measure position two in the correct position there, so from there, turning the right hand over a little bit, that's going to help with three, four, five, six, seven into impact. It's going to help with that. So by getting the right hand to turn over just a little bit on the way back, we're closing the face, pointing the grooves towards the ground just a little bit more. That golf ball is unacceptable. There, taking the club back, I'm normally here, let's get the right hand just to turn down a little bit. That's flattening the left wrist and then maintain that feeling to the top. Does feel a little bit closed for me. Strike was great, that's got a draw. Got a draw on that one, excellent. All I did there was I got to my normal position and then turned the right hand to feel there. Take the club back, normal position, feel there, that's where I want to be. So let's try and just get there without stopping, there we go. Then I take the club back, my right hand's rolling down just a fraction. There, good. Good, yep, I'm feeling that, then stand up, execute. Good again. Little drills like that are important to feel, feel, feel what's going to happen. Take it back, turn it over. Take it back, turn it over. And then incorporate the turn with the take back. Take back and turn, take back and turn. Then execute. You'll get there, trust me. Good. Turn. Take back. Turn. Take back. Turn. Take back and turn. I can use the leading edge as my reference point. Good. Step up. Execute. That's good for. Right, who's not subscribed? Why not? Wee button, just there, hit it. If you've seen my Eureka Golf Swing stuff and you've been on eurekagolfswing.com, thank you, brilliant, really, really good, that's done really well. I'm looking forward to continuing that in 2020. We're going to probably add a few more videos on there, um, one about shot shaping because it's all about hitting draw. If you slice it just now or lose the ball out to the right, this encourages a draw, right to left flight or even certainly straightens up the flight. This year we're going to put in one on how to fade it with Eureka Golf Swing, so I believe that we can have the same swing for every golf shop Exactly the same swing, hitting driver, wedge, seven iron, draw, fade, it can all come from the same swing. How good would life be if we can achieve that? And I feel as though we can through eurekagolfswing.com. Head there right now, the link is up on the left hand side, right hand, it's, it's, it's there somewhere. Eh? <laughs>